This is Larry Bauer, Chief Executive Officer of the Family Medicine Education Consortium, and I'm talking today with Dr. Tom Wilkinson, a family physician who is Chief Medical Information Officer at the Department of Homeland Security. Tom, it's great to be talking with you. Thanks, Larry. Thank you for having me. So we're going to give a little uh, background, or you're going to give a little background on, on who you are and and how you got to be uh, doing what you're doing right now. Um, but I want to start you off with, um, I understand that before you went to medical school, you were an archaeologist. <laughs> yes, <clears throat> that was um, one of many circuitous paths in life. And um, so I, uh, I started archaeology even as an undergraduate. And, um, and I, I spent, uh, spent several years in in the Mediterranean area, I, my specialty was in um, uh, urban development and decline in classical and pre-classical cultures. And so I, <clears throat> I worked in Italy, Greece, Turkey, and Israel for the most part. I had a, 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 a little fling out in Sri Lanka right before the Civil War, and then I got sent home. Um, so it, it was when I was working in Turkey that my mom became ill. She eventually died, and uh, and it changed my mind about where I was. I I, um, I thought I was spending entirely too many hours with dead people and not enough with the living. So I um, <clears throat> I changed course and uh, and uh, went to medical school after that. Then after you finished your medical school and your residency, um, you moved to uh, rural uh, Maryland, Eastern Shore? Not the Eastern Shore. It's the southern tip of the Western Shore. It's called St. Uh, Mary's County. It's the uh, mother county of Maryland. It's where the colonists landed and where my ancestors landed. My family's been here since the 1630s. And, um, <clears throat> and we have, um, uh, and, and so I, live on the family farm, even still. It, it's about 65 miles south of Washington. So it's a, uh, uh, when we're not in COVID mode, it's a two hour commute each way. Then you served with the Peace Corps after you, you left rural. How many years were you in practice? Uh, I, I ran my practice from 2000 to 2012, more or less. That's about right. And then, so then, then to the Peace Corps. I then worked at the Peace Corps from uh, 2012 to, uh, till just last fall, so 2019. And now on to Homeland Security. That is correct, yes. So, you know, it's a little unusual for a family physician <laughs> um, to be uh, in that position, but I, I know you well enough and I've heard you talk about uh, your love for big data. So how does that play in family doc and Homeland Security who loves big data? What's that all about? You know, I, 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 how do you pull threads through your life and say, well, this one finally tied together with this other one? I don't know. I was always good with computers, even back in the 80s when they were the size of refrigerators. I was always good at them. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, in the 80s, I, I did... Um, uh, some research in, uh, in neural networks, which were kind of cresting. It, it was the first crest of, of neural networks, which is the basis for a lot of deep learning right now. Uh, the, uh, it, was, it was its first crest. It was uh, kind of a hot topic and I was you know, all, you know, all university about me, so I was very interested. But what I built were physiologic models of uh, of uh, the NMDA circuit in the brain. And, uh, and that got me, I, I had to program in order to develop the model. I was very interested in how, how it could work. And so ultimately I um, <clears throat> just acquired the skill and it never left me. But that was kind of a parallel universe for a while. I don't, you know, I was, uh, I, I had uh, some native skill in math and and, uh, and active interest in family medicine and public health. And so, it, we, and public health uses a lot of math. 
So I, you know, I guess the strings finally wove together uh, when I graduated residency, or actually my third year in residency, where I took a uh, medical informatics uh, rotation in my senior year there at uh, Abington Hospital in, in uh, just north of Philadelphia, and um, and um, then remained on at Abington Family Medicine as faculty. I was uh, I, I was in charge of of uh, medical informatics curriculum, which is a brand new thing for for family medicine, and a, uh, and evidence based medicine and and uh, journal club and and those things. So <clears throat> I finally wove those those two threads together. I'm not sure I'll ever get archaeology woven into my medical thread, but I'm I'm still you know I'm still kicking. It may happen. Yeah. Cool. So I know that you have a uh, a passion for the doctor patient relationship and i've heard you talk about that and the value of that and the lack of awareness that you see among family physicians about the the real power and value of that could could you speak to that it's a big topic <clears throat> i i will try to be succinct about it but it, it's uh it, it, let me start from a place that you're not going to expect. And the, if you talk to data scientists and ask them, what is their biggest headache? What is the thing that they spend the most time spinning their wheels on it? Uh, the answer is cleaning the data, that they'll get a data set and it's going to have missing information and, and contradictory information and what have you. And and for for most data scientists, they will easily allocate 80% of their effort, 80% to cleaning the data. So now take that little nugget and, and park it in medicine. We are a data intense profession. We, we create data, we, we create analysis of data, we layer it with additional data, contextual information. It is, it's all about the data but the person who has the front seat and the one who is most likely to have the cleanest data is the family doctor who sits with the patient the doctor patient relationship is the core relationship in all of medicine and <clears throat> you may not be aware uh, but medical data has an entire life of its own uh, physicians or, or providers in general will, will, uh, will create encounter information. So they, they, they visit with a patient, they, they create information about it. And, um, uh, and that data has its own life. It ends up in um, de-identified in third parties and resold in all different ways. Uh, a very big market for it is uh, the, that data, especially in aggregate form, is the um, insurance industry who are always looking for trends and anomalies and uh, and looking for ways to control costs. But in the end, my, my point is that the data live on beyond the examination room. It goes from there and it, it, it has an entire industry that is evolving and, and anchored on the data that we generate as physicians in the examination room. The, the thing that has, has my attention is that the, those data in the end are our, our work product. So, so it is absolutely true that, that the patient owns the core information, they own the data. It is their body that we talk about. So it is their data. But to say that the physician has no interest in the data that they add, I think is, is, is misunderstanding the context. It's our work product. We make, ad, we make additional data. We, we, we collect information, we sort it in a way that, that creates narrative and, 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 and understanding and we, layer additional laboratories or, or radiologic information or, <clears throat> or information from, from a specialist 
and we collect that information, that value is added. That is not something that the patient owns. It's something that the doctor owns. Well, so look at it in that way, that there, that nugget then leaves us and goes somewhere else, has a life of its own. And it is a billion dollar industry, the life after our use of that data. It's a billion dollar industry projected to be somewhere around 50 to $60 billion in the next three years. It's huge. And all that data started with us. And yet we don't see the value of it. The value is in the reseller. And the funny part is, or, or the irony of it, is that uh, providers are expected to be, as pay, pay per performance uh, becomes more important, or, or value-based pay becomes more important, we are expected to become the biggest market for that secondary market. We're going to buy back our own data. We're buying it back even though we owned it in the first place. So, so I'm watching the life of, of the data. I'm watching the life of the information and I'm thinking it all starts with the relationship, the doctor and the patient having a discussion. We sit in the front seat. We have the best ability to control the quality of the data coming in. We have the best way. It isn't that we clean the data per se, although every time you do a medication reconciliation, that is definitely data cleaning. But we, we, we are curators of information about that patient. And it is extraordinarily valuable and becoming even more so. And I would like to call it out to, to family physicians and to providers in general and say, look at this, uh, look at the, the physician patient relationship as, as, the, as the primary entity, the, the kernel of the healthcare system. And notice we're the ones sitting right there in the center, right at the bullseye. And all, all the data goes somewhere else, but we have an opportunity right at that moment of data creation, we have an opportunity to actually control it ourselves. And I think it has the it has a, a possibility of, of being very disruptive of the way healthcare is bought and paid for. Just, you know, just thoughts. Could you, Help me understand. So you're sitting in the exam room. You've got the uh, electronic medical record open. You're processing the information uh, through the relationship with the patient. You're entering data into, um, into the electronic medical record. Um, how could, just sort of um, speculating, how could uh, the physician maintain ownership of that it's a it, we would need a different kind of medical record system in order to do it so the large commercial entities that control most of the market share it for um for electronic health records they have a business model uh and and uh <clears throat> much as they say that they are really focused on uh, on physician needs when they build their records, I would counter that they actually are more focused on administrative needs and that the cognitive process of which medicine, family medicine is about cognition. It is so cognitive. I mean, that's what, that's what the CPT codes are. It's just, it's just you, you provide a 99214 for somebody, it's because it's cognitive. You are thinking for them on their behalf. So we, are, um, we don't have tools that are designed to help us with the cognitive aspects of medicine. And, and that may be one of the cornerstone reasons that providers love to hate their EHRs. They spend a lot of time on blogs and in, in chat rooms discussing how much they falter, how, how in, intrusive the medical record system is into that relationship. So you have to reimagine how can the primacy of the relationship be reinforced rather than antagonized by, by the IT systems. And, and the answer is not by the current commercial products, 
they they go a different way. They they serve a different purpose, and uh, and so we need to start. We need to strip it down and start over. But speaking hypothetically, it these there are technologies whereby the kernel information, the de the demographics, and so forth that belong to the to the patient can be locked down by encryption that is controlled only by the patient. The doctor can add in a layer around that, can add additional information, value added information about that patient and context and work product that we do <clears throat> and duly encrypt it so that it cannot be used except by permission from both the doctor and the patient. Anybody who read the uh, the story about Henrietta Lacks, or saw the, the film uh, with Oprah, that I think tells you about the, the, the importance, the primacy of making sure that the patient, it's their body. We need to be so sensitive that this is a collaborative stance. We work with the patient on this. But if we together own, encrypt the data and own it, there are ways of encryption that basically could leave that little nugget of data on the sidewalk and nobody could use it unless you said they could. It's a way of then controlling who has access. And if you were to sell your data, so to speak, to the open market, to, to all those companies for whom, for whom the secondary aggregation of information is valuable to them and their customers, then I think you begin to create a whole different way of reimbursing for medicine a whole, or, or at least augmenting the, the business aspects of medicine. It would be disruptive because it will remove status and diminish the, the, the market for our, our traditional EHRs and, and, the, and the kind of classically hospital administrator driven decision making that brought us to them. That those are the that it will be disruptive, but in the end, if we control our data, then think about how that macroeconomic system supports the micro system of of the doctor and the patient working together to make a quality product to make something that helps the patient. In, in, in their time of need when they've come to us and they're asking for help, help them. But in addition, make sure that they always have control over how that helps other people, which in the end is why that information has value. I think that it's ultimately when we aggregate it, it helps other people, whether it's businesses or other patients with similar constellations of symptoms or, or, or disease intersections or what have you. So that would require or imply um, a quite a different uh, world view of of the value and role of the family physician. Uh, instead of being frustrated and feeling used, you're now with the patient in the driver's seat. I that's how I would see it, and 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 again trying to align macroeconomic forces to, to support the, the microeconomics of it. I think that is the key, is to, to drive the behavior, which is the collaboration right at the core. But now, instead of rolling your eyes every time you have to do a medication reconciliation, you know, to be crass about it, you could see little dollar signs in your eyes because the better you do that, the more valuable it is because the less cleaning downstream, that 80% job that a data scientist needs to do later, you've just eliminated that. That means your data has value more so. I mean, you take it to market, so to speak, and the market value is higher because it's cleaner or better or more thoughtful data. Any family physician who's gotten an a irrelevant consultation knows the value of a thoughtful consultation. You provide thoughtful information on your patient, and that is value. And not only value for that patient, which who, who's our primary customer, but it's value for the, the, the profession of medicine, because this is how we're going to be able to detect uh, the emergence. You know, it was a doc who, decided, who found out that COVID-19 was emerging in Wuhan. It was somebody who drew it together, who said these three, five cases 
they look similar. Something's not right here. I need to figure this out. This is how it works. Somebody on the front lines figures these things out. The better you do your data, the cleaner it is, the more likely we are to help ourselves, our profession, our the, the communities that we serve, the much more likely we are able to detect anomalies and patterns. Those, are, those things come from quality data. The more times that you, the so many times I've seen that the prostate was normal even though it's a female patient. Or, you know, or it just, when you take the time to make a medical record that is valuable, that has reliable information and insightful narrative, put that out on the market and it cleans up 80% of some profession's job. And that has value, that is measurable value. It is an idea that is, I think, um, forward leaning and, and will take work to get there. But the technology isn't the problem. That it's, it's here now. The, the, uh, the thing that's needed is the, uh, the changing conceptual framework by which we look at the relationship primary care has with the patient. I want to say thank you very much. Um, it will be fun to share this uh, video with people to get people thinking uh, about uh, a, a new way of uh, seeing the role of family physician, primary care uh, clinicians um, in, um, in, in, the, in the marketplace. So thank you very much, Tom. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, the uh, evening on the first when you and the others will be joined in a plenary session. Um, I think that's gonna be a lot of fun also. Thanks so much, Larry. It's good to be here.